So welcome everyone. And tonight uh, we're going to talk about spectro spectroscopy and spectroscopes. Um, you've heard of paint by the numbers. This is chemical analysis by the numbers. Uh, and it works more than in space. It's also uh, used in healthcare and crime labs and all sorts of things. But first, let's get to the news. I had commented last week that uh, the Boeing Starliner rocket and capsule were brought back to the assembly building. Um, and that didn't bode well for them launching it soon. Uh, and it turns out it's now been uh, delayed indefinitely. Um, they have a problem with their valves in the capsule, as I had kind of stated that that could be a problem. Um, if you have a valve that's supposed to be closed and it's closed and indicating closed, that's fine. But if you have a valve that's supposed to be closed, indicating closed, but is partially open, that's not good. So <clears throat> they found this to be a problem and they're taking it back in to do some, I guess, redesign work on how these valves function or are sent. The European Space Agency has a number of space probes up there. One of them is Gaia. Uh, this is the picture of Gaia. Uh, it's uh, capable of picking up, uh, I guess you could say, unusual things in patterns of the night sky. So as it takes its night sky pictures, it's looking to identify the population of stars in our galaxy. And they found one that was moving, moving rather quickly. And turns out that there is a uh, star that's a white dwarf. It's called LP40-365. And it is hauling like a bat out of hell, as the saying goes. Uh, to leave our galaxy. It's not on the edge of the galaxy yet, but at the rate that it's going, it's obviously targeted to leave our galaxy. And they uh, supposed that there was a nova, not a supernova, but just a nova, which is a large stellar explosion. And one of the things that happened was the red giant, when the white dwarf took out the uh, red giant, uh, the red giant, when it went boom, propelled this uh, white dwarf star off on a tangent, and now it's moving at uh, 852 kilometers per second. <laughs> well, that's, that's fast. So expect it to go away quickly. And while we're on the European Space Agency, uh, the spacecraft with a funny sounding name that's uh, orbiting sort of very elongated Venus, Mercury, Sun kind of thing. Bepi Colombo, um, it did another flyby of Venus and this time it flew a little closer to Venus and it's still hundreds of miles above Venus. So it, um, not dangerously close, but uh, they just wanted to show off, you know, get, get their name in the, uh, the news, so to speak. So when they did their flyby of Venus, they turned the cameras on and, uh, um, you got to see a large white globe go flying past in a couple of frames. Uh, you know, it, it was, the camera is a visual light camera. So it's not meant to pierce the dense cloud structure of, uh, uh, of Venus. So all you saw was a large white globe go whizzing by. And uh, researchers in, in Japan have found a way to um, do uh, quantum entanglement uh, on surfaces. Normally quantum entanglement is, is kind of between two points in, in space and you do the entanglement there. And that means that it's, it, it's very hard to get a lot of entanglements in a small amount of space. But if you're going to increase the number of qubits in your quantum computing computer, uh, then you need a way of having a lot more qubits in a lot less space. Uh, you, you can see the uh, picture here. Each one of these little curly Q wires uh, goes up to a location where there is a quibit located. And they all have to come down and join into um, a, these are all hollow tubes uh, to convey microwaves to generate the, uh, the residence. Um, so it's gonna be hard to get the number of quibits up to the millions 
because all this, this plumbing density is just too large. So they're gonna have to uh, find some new ways of doing this until they get that, hey, Eureka breakthrough, um, quantum computers are probably gonna be in the maybe a few hundred to a small number of thousand qubits. And they need to get up into the many millions of qubits before it makes realistic computers. Monroe? Yes. This, this is this picture. Um, how big is that that item that's there? Like if I stood next to it, would it, it be bigger than me or is it like a small thing that I held? It's my hand? taller than it, the entire structure is taller than you and about uh, 24 inches in diameter. So it's, as the saying goes, compared to a modern day computer chip, it's enormous. Yeah. And if you count down here at the bottom, every one of these little plumbing pipes is one qubit. That's like saying one bit in the computer. So if you're trying to get to a million bits in your computer, this physical size is just not gonna cut it. They're gonna have to come up with some new technology to make things much, much smaller. And also, this is with the enclosure removed. This whole thing is inside of a giant bottle that has liquid helium flowing around inside of it to keep it super cool. So they have to make it smaller and make it run at room temperature before it ever becomes a realistic computer. And they made it this big because- They're, they're working at the quantum entanglement level and you can either work with electrons or photons. And depending upon what you choose, it defines what you use in the form of energy to excite your quibit to make it, you know, turn on or turn off. And the amount of energy they need to do this is relatively large for the size of the quibit. So it makes the quibits fairly large. And, you know, you can't just have one quibit because there's a quantum uncertainty for your qubit, your uh, quantum bit. And so one is not really one, it's you need maybe three of them to come out with one good one. Uh, so quantum computers will be hyped a lot in the coming years. But until you stop seeing all these curly cues and looks like little coax connectors, um, not gonna be big time any so anytime soon. But doesn't stop the likes of uh, you know IBM and Google from spending probably a billion dollars on quantum computing. Well, you have to do this first before you can figure out how to make them smaller, right? Well, that's where they're starting. They understood the basics of quantum entanglement and how to get the entanglement to occur, but they never thought about scale. Why would you even start until you can get it small enough? Oh, okay. And then I remember back to the early days of computers and core memory. And I worked for a company called ModComp that did real-time process control computing. And they had a circuit board that had um, 1,000 bits of high-speed memory on it. And it was 1,000 core bits. And each one of the donuts of uh, magnetic material was the size of a pencil eraser and they had these uh, workers that were taking very long needles and darning the cores, the wire connections to the cores by hand. Yeah. So that's where things start. If you've ever seen the first microwave oven or the first xerographic photocopier, you'd never want to buy one. They'd be too expensive, too big, consume too much power and be too unreliable. But unless you start there, you're never going to get to where we are today. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. Just, just give Do it some time. Do you think we might get to, you mean like tw 10 years from now, you think we're going to have a quantum computer for home people using it? No, I think, I think they're very much eager to have the, you know, multi-million dollar, we will rent you time on a quantum computer or we will build and lease you a quantum computer. Think back to the early days of computers when IBM had the IBM 360s. And uh -huh. as a business, they were more than sufficiently fast enough for you to improve um, your accounting systems and reduce, you know, cut staff because you didn't need you know, people doing things by hand anymore or even by calculator. Um, 
So it was well worth it for large corporations to spend millions of dollars to just lease the computers. And as the computers got bigger and better, um, you could either lease at the current level or you could lease with a upgradable level. Uh, if you lease the upgradable level when IBM went from a, you know, 370 to whatever they came up with next, IBM for no additional fee except for maybe some service installation fee would put you in the next better computer. And uh, companies like IBM uh, really did enjoy that thick money spreading on their revenue. And um, they want to do the same thing with quantum computers. So they are building very expensive quantum computers to sell time on and to sell to private corporations that can afford the cha-ching to buy one. Um, so you know, look for them to be big and expensive for a while. And unless there's some really dramatic breakthroughs in shrinking the technology and getting away from uh, critical supercooling, um, don't look for them to be in your laptop anytime soon. Yeah. And um, I mentioned last week about the uh, new Russian module attached to the International Space Station. And it had some difficulties getting up to the space station. And then as soon as it was attached to the space station, it turned on its navigational thrusters and wanted to shove the space station around. So there's been a couple of problems. And the last problem that they found was there was a leak. There was a hole, you know, a very small hole, but there was a leak that was uh, exhausting the space station atmosphere into space. And uh, what's the source of that problem? Well, rather than comment on what's the source of the current modules problem, uh, the Russian space program said, you remember back in 2018 when we had a different Russian module that had an air leak? That was because of one of your NASA astronauts going cuckoo and drilling a hole through the Russian space module because uh, that astronaut wanted to get back, back down to Earth sooner. And of course, oh, NASA's no. saying, of course, NASA's saying, what's your evidence of this? Where there was a hole? What's your evidence that that astronaut drilled the hole? We just know. Okay. Uh. So in answer to the current hole in the newly added Russian module, the answer is, well, remember back in 2018 when we had a hole? It was your fault. Well, what about the hole that you've got now? Is that also our fault? No. So, yeah. That sounds bizarre. Somebody wanted to get home earlier, so they drew a hole in it? Well, it's just a small hole. So you have an air leak, and when you have a, an air leak that jeopardizes the safety of the astronauts, you have to abandon the space station. And I guess that's what Russia is saying is, by having the air leak, it threatened everybody on board the space station, and therefore, somehow, everybody being evacuated would allow this astronaut to get back down to Earth, uh, you know, much shorter than the actual scheduled time for them to be in orbit. Uh, I don't give it much credence. I'll just wait for more details. Okay, I wanted to hear that. All right, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's a lot of, uh, they said, they said. And then something that I found bizarre this week, this, this was kind of my rant. Um, <clears throat> If you own an electric vehicle and you're about to either get a driver's license or renew one and you go to take your in-person driving test, you may find that your state's local department of motor vehicles doesn't know how to deal with electric vehicles. What could go wrong? Well, uh, if you remember back to when you first had to take a driver's test, the person that was giving you the test would tell you when to step on the gas, when to step on the brake, you know, when to go into park, when to go into drive. And modern, you know, contemporary design electric vehicles do a lot of that stuff for you. You don't have to do it. So there was a person taking a driving test in California and 
the driving instructor said, okay, take your foot off the gas. And the person took their foot off the gas and the car started to noticeably slow down. That's because the car has regenerative braking. It's an electric vehicle. So it slows down all by itself. You don't have to actually put your foot on the brake pedal. And if you let it stay in regenerative mode long enough, the car will actually come to a stop without you ever having to put your foot on the brake pedal. And the, um, the uh, DMV testing person uh, failed the driver on their driving test because the DMV tester didn't understand how an electric vehicle works. So uh, a lot of electric vehicle owners uh, sort of ranted and raved to the California Department of Motor Vehicles to please up the education of your driving testers to understand how electric vehicles work. <laughs> so, I, you know, things don't work the way they used to. They work the way they do. And I posted uh, last week's video on astronomical public observing post pandemic, posted that out to the YouTube site. So that's all I had this week for the news. Um, I um, spent a lot of time 3D printing the parts for the James Webb Space Telescope, learning more about the web and uh, um, it, you know, what its lifespan will be and what things will come beyond it. And uh, because it takes so long to create these spacecraft from scratch to design them and to get them uh, scheduled in and to get uh, um, congressional funding to build them and you know test them and, and then launch them. You have to be two or three spacecraft ahead. And there are currently four um, upcoming spacecraft targeting all the way to the late 2030s um, for next bigger, better, you know, spacecraft. And while the web is infrared and the next telescope, the Nancy Grace Roman is also infrared, we're gonna get back into the full spectrum after that. There's two enormous uh, dish uh, telescopes that they'll be putting up at the L2 point um, that will make James Webb look tiny. But I also learned um, the web has uh, some limitations on where it can point. Because it is super cooled by liquid helium, um, you can't just let it sort of tilt that way because then it would be facing the sun and that would cause bad things to happen with its helium and its instruments. So the, the uh, foil that protects it from the sun always has to face the sun. And the instrument always has to be on the other side. So yeah. it can rotate 360 this way, but it can only tilt this way and this way five degrees. Oh. And the shield actually bends in slightly like this to better protect the front of the telescope. So it can't tilt that way more than about um, 85 degrees. You know, if that was 90, it can only get about five degrees further yeah. down. Uh, and also it's at the Lagrange L2 point. So if you think of the sun here, the earth here, the moon here, and the L2 point here, and that swings around just as the earth is rotating around the sun. So there are certain parts of the sky that it can't see except for, you know, a few days window every year. So there's all sorts of uh, constraints, caveats uh, that have to go into the observing planning computer software to make sure that, yes, you can look at that on the date that you want and that this is the maximum duration you can observe that. Otherwise, you have to wait until, you know, next year or, you know, a few months down the road to when it swings around to that part of the sky to take a look at it. Got a question. Sure. Uh, they, I know they tried to drill out a sample on Mars and it, there was not, it didn't show up as anything. They figure it all changed to dust and wouldn't pick up. They don't have anything that could suck up the dust? Like a well, vacuum? Well, here, here's the thing. Um, they brought a knife to a gunfight is the best way to describe it. <laughs> um, the instrument that they're using to bring rock 
core samples back is what is known as a corer. They, when you uh, want to take the core out of an apple, you yeah. have this tube shaped thing that you drive and screw down into the apple and then right. you pull it back out and the core of the apple is stuck up inside of it. Well, that's, that's what they were expecting to have happen is, you know, we're driving over this rock in our rover. It's got to be really hard rock in order for that to work, right? Uh -huh. So they brought the arm out. They took this metal tube that has sharp edge on the bottom and they cored. And then they pulled the core out and nothing was in the core. Right. Because the rock underneath him is actually just very loosely compressed powder. Yeah. The, the mass and the surface area of the rover are such that you don't notice that you're you know, driving around on top of semi-solid talcum powder. Uh -huh. But when you drill a core and then you pull up your core and nothing's inside, and then you look over on your spoils pile, that's where all the core went. It's just powder sitting there on the ground. Um, so they're going to have to be creative and think of a way to, you know, tilt the coring tube sideways and scoop up some and then <laughs> pour it into the, uh, I don't know what they're going to do. But that was what I had said last week was their core was obviously too efficient and converted all of the rock underneath the, the coring device to powder. And it's now in the spoils pile. So when they, you know, they did their coring, and they looked in the hole, there was nothing in the hole because right. it's all here. So they need to scoop up the powder or um, they can find some harder rock. Yeah. Now it would be interesting. So that they need to do this coring a few times, but it would be interesting scientifically to realize that Mars is um, a very fine rubble pile and not as hard a stone as people might think it of it, of it is when they refer to, you know, Martian rock. Yeah. Martian rock may not be much, much more than um, compressed rust, uh, you know, iron oxide with some silicates in it. Yeah. So it, you know, when the water left, it got really dried out and it's been irradiated by solar wind. So it's really, really dried out. So you may have to dig down quite a long distance before you're going to hit bedrock. Uh-huh. Wow. We shall okay. see. Thank you. Yeah. No, I, I found it fascinating. So I, as usual, had to do my polymath deep, deep dive into it. So <laughs> what, what's going on here? Well, if you were to drill with a coring device into a giant pile of compressed talcum powder, this would happen. OK. And then you look at the spoil pile where they were drilling the core in. Looks like fine talcum powder to me. It's gray, but. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, wow. OK. So any other news that I might have missed? Nope. OK. Hello again. And uh, tonight's presentation is going to be on spectroscopy. Uh, you've heard of paint by the numbers. Well, spectroscopy is chemical analysis by the numbers. So in order to carry the information for spectroscopy to work, we need something that will convey energy. And the energy itself is kind of a vague term. Physicists use it to describe many things. But in this case, what we're looking for is photons. Um, you can transfer energy by you know, atoms bumping into each other and exchanging electrons or uh, chemicals bonding to make compounds. But in this case, we're, we're looking for photons. So where do you get your photons? So if you take an atom of any element, you apply a specific amount of energy in the form of either electrons bumping it or uh, other photons impacting the electrons in the atom, uh, it'll generate photons. But uh, your, your applied energy has to be of a specific level in order to get it to nudge the electrons in an atom to uh, other orbits that they don't like that. They don't like having that excess energy. So they will expel the excess energy and go to other lower energy orbits. And when they do, they spit out a photon. So an electron has a baseline energy state that it would like to return to if it has enough electrons. Um, so if you excite it, 
it will spit out photons and try and get back down to that base level site, uh, base level state. So this is how um, light works. This is how radio works. Uh, X-rays, uh, gamma rays, uh, not cosmic rays. Those are different. Those are chunks of atoms. Um, but uh, whenever you produce photons, that's kind of light. And whenever you take in photons, that's absorption. So things heat up or change. Uh, so you can have absorbed or emitted. So what kind of energy sources are we talking about? Um, the lowest energy sources are things like radio waves. And the next step from that is heat or infrared. I mean, you get a little more energetic and you're into the visible light range where we can see things. And you get a little more energy and you start to get into ultraviolet where we can't see it anymore. So you go from infrared we can't see to visible light to ultraviolet that we can't see. And when you go even higher than ultraviolet, you start getting into things like uh, X-rays and gamma rays. Now, when you get into the high energy stuff, uh, that's not good for your DNA because it tends to be small enough and energetic enough that it can disrupt um, the bonds within your uh, DNA. Uh, it can also split atoms if it's energetic enough, and that's how you get the uh, fission. So here's a very simplified atom. This is basically hydrogen. So on the left, you see the atom at its lovely, comfortable ground state. Uh, it's got uh, a nucleus, and it's got one electron going around it. The nucleus is positive protons, and the electron is negative. And all of a sudden, this photon comes in and you know, impact, interacts with the electron. And now the electron has to go to an excited energy state. Well, if you give it just the right amount, it will come out from whatever orbit it was at to an, a more outer orbit. And if you give it enough energy, it'll actually leave the electron as uh, ionization. So you've actually ionized the atom, removed an electron from it. Uh, the atom will be starved for electrons and we'll go looking for wherever it can get them from. Um, but uh, the idea with what we're doing with spectroscopy is we don't want to fully excite the atoms. We want them to spit out photons. Uh, and that way we know what kind of atom um, produced this photon. So if we excite it just enough for it to emit a photon and then go back to its ground state, that's the kind of photons we're looking for because the energy in that photon that is emitted is a signature of where the electron was, how high up in energy it went, and then when it dropped back down, the energy in that photon tells us what kind of atom this was. So it gives us a signature. So this, this is a lot of verbiage, but we're going to get into a, a picture that says a thousand words as the saying goes. So depending upon the number of protons or the atomic number of an element uh, and its current level of excitation, is it at the ground state or not? Uh, an atom can have multiple electrons, each in ground or excited states. In other words, behaving where they are comfortable or excited and wanting to either um, ionize and leave the atom or just spit out photons and come back down. So an atom with a neutral charge has as many electrons as it has protons. You've heard of an isotope. Well, an isotope is an element that has fewer neutrons or more neutrons than it has protons. But we're not going to deal with isotopes tonight. We're just going to deal with uh, whether the atom is excited or at ground state. So electrons move about the nucleus of the atom in orbitals, which uh, we used to favorably call shells. But that's uh, while a visual description of them. It's not a uh, practical description of them. They actually move in very complex 3D patterns, um, which we won't get into those. We'll just describe them with letters. So when you have an electron in one of these uh, orbits, uh, it transitions to uh, specific energy levels. So if you have an electron and you give it too much energy, it could actually be um, ionized and leave the atom. But if you give it too much, but not enough to be ionized, it'll ignore the energy. If you give it too low amount of energy, it says not enough for me and ignores it. 
So this contributes to the photons coming out with a specific energy associated with the atom. So too little energy, the electron doesn't change orbitals. Too much energy, uh, it'll ionize. Just the right amount of energy and it could change one or multiple orbitals. So the quantity of orbitals and the energies of the electrons at those levels are unique to each element. It's almost their signature. So if we take a broad spectrum source of photons, let's say white light, and we shine it at a material, then we're going to get photons out of it where the uh, energy level of the photons that we pick up are, are representative of the kind of element that we shine the light on. So this is what makes it possible for us to identify the signature of an element, either in emission or absorption. Okay, this is a lot of data in one slide, but the pictures on the right help. Um, I picked an element, oxygen in this case, which is um, atomic number eight. Eight is the number of protons it has in its nucleus. And when the atom is uh, at ground state, it has eight electrons. And the electrons show up in uh, two orbitals, two shells. Uh, the K and the L, sometimes they're numbered. You might see the innermost one numbered one. And the next one out is two. Um, but uh, within each one of those shells or orbits, uh, it has more than one um, electron that can inhabit that. And that's where we start getting in those uh, unusual 3D shapes of the path of an electron. And suffice it to say, we just given those letters. So S, P, D, F. So if you're looking at that uh, K shell, uh, it's got a letter of S and that gives it two electrons. So you can see one, two. And the next level out, the L, uh, the L has P, uh, P. Uh, so we can put uh, up to eight there, but we don't have eight. We've only got uh, two and then six more. So it doesn't quite fill it out. So we have a, an atom of oxygen there. Now the, the atoms, um, exterior electrons, the ones that are all the way out on the outer edge, those are the easiest ones to get excited and ionize and leave the atom. Um, the ones on the inside take a lot more energy to coax out from the atom. So that dictates the energy level. So if you said, I've put in this quantity of energy and I got out um, one photon at a particular wavelength. Uh, it probably came from one of those electrons on the outermost uh, level, the, the L, and therefore it would be you know, a particular emission level. Um, there's actually a website that the US NIST uh, organization put together where you can actually go in and look up Okay, I want to look up uh, what kind of wavelengths can oxygen spit out if excited and which electrons in its orbitals get excited when it puts out, you know, a, a photon of this wavelength of this, nano, this many nanometers. So you can actually go in there and say, uh, the electron in the out, you know, in the outside edge, there'd be one, two, three, four, five, six ones uh, in the L, if I excited one of those and it produced a photon, what would be the electronic configuration of that atom? And it's 2s2, 2p4. Funny way of stating it, but uh, if you look at the layers, two for that uh, first layer has two electrons in it. And the next layer has four electrons in it. So that's how you get to your number of them. Uh, they don't all occupy the same uh, level. If you have uh, two that are at the same orbital, they have to be in different spins. Uh, spin is kind of a weird term. It doesn't really mean the electrons are rotating one way or the other way. It just means they have a different characteristic, and that characteristic we've called spin. So if the spin is up for one of the electrons and down for the other, they can inhabit the exact same orbital. But if you have two with the same spin, uh, you got to bump them to another level. And that's what that uh, sort of triangular diagram is there. It says if, if you start applying electrons to an atom, um, this is the 
uh, way in which you'll fill out the atom. And when they first started deciphering the, uh, the electrons, and the protons, the neutrons uh, of an atom, they found that, oh good, it'll all fill out the inner layers before it gets to the outer layers. And then they found 20 different elements that it didn't work that way. When you excited it, the electrons weren't where you expected them to be. They carried out different levels of energy. So they came up with this ruling called the Madelung rule. So the off-bow principle is, you know, filling the innermost first to the outermost. But when you came up with these 20 elements and found they don't work that way, they came up with a, a side rule, the Madelung rule. So it, it's, it's weird to see hard science facts having rules for exceptions, but uh, until you come up with a better way of explaining it, that's the, that's the way it works. So when you have emissions, you'll have bright lines. So if you look at the spectrum down there on the bottom, I shouldn't say spectrum, I should say spectra down there on the bottom. Um, the places where you see bright lines are emissions uh, specific to whatever this element is spitting out. And the continuous color pattern you see across there is the continuous spectrum of whatever you sent to it. You know, white light, that's the continuous spectrum of white light. So how do we change the path of photons? Well, when you just simply change the path of a photon, that's a mirror. So light going in at a certain angle comes out at an uh, appropriate angle coming out, and uh, all the light that goes in comes out, except for a very small amount that gets absorbed by the surface of the mirror. But that does, doesn't do anything any good for our uh, uh, spectroscopy. So what we do is we take the light and we allow it to be refracted, bent, by a material like a prism or a grating or a curved lens. And as the light transitions from one medium, let's say air, to this denser medium, let's say glass or plastic, um, different wavelengths of light bend at a different angle. That's their index uh, of refraction. Uh, so the light gets bent, and if you bend different frequencies at a slightly different angle, it spreads the white light out into a rainbow effect, and we take advantage of that to uh, make a spectral image. So you see there on the right the continuous, that's the bright white light source, and then when the light comes back from whatever you've shined it on, that's the emission or bright line spectra, and if the um, material that you shine the light on is starved for energy. It's not at a, um, you know, it's at an excited state and it wants to get back to a ground state. It will take in your photons and not give you anything back. How rude. But, you know, when they do that, that takes away the bright line. But you can either use the bright lines to say something emitted that, or you can use the dark line to say something absorbed that. And that is the signature of the element upon which you're you know, getting your spectrum. So a spectroscope, that's the instrument. Uh, spectroscopy is the process. Uh, a spectra is the color band. And a spectrum is kind of the, the result coming out of it. Um, so there, there's, it's kind of like meteor, meteorite, meteoroid. There's a slightly different flavor word for each step of the process. Around 1860, Kirchhoff and Bunsen, yep, the burner guy, um, were the ones that are given credit for coming up with uh, uh, spectroscopy. Um, Isaac Newton actually used a prism in the 1600s to break apart light, but he didn't make the connection that that band of different colors is actually the signature of the material that the white light's coming off, of, uh, the white light's you know, ab absorbed or reflecting off of. So while um, you know Newton was the first to you know say look what a prism does, um, he didn't make the connection with, and that means it's this kind of material that you're shining your light off of. So um, Kirchhoff and Bunsen got that award. It's it's kind of like um, Galileo isn't the first person to build or look through a telescope. I think it was guys uh, on ships that did that first. 
Um, Galileo was the first guy to just point it up in the sky and go, what are all those bright things? So as I was saying, um, it can either absorb light that you send to it, or it can emit light itself. And that's the uh, absorption or uh, emission or bright line spectrum. And the instrument uh, produces a spectra, but if you've got the sort of hard copy or stored data of this, uh, it's a spectrum. Uh, and the spectrograph is, uh, sometimes you'll see it on printed paper, but the spectroscope is the instrument. So a spectroscope is Hello. not just, yes? Can I ask a question? Can you go back sure. to the last page? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. At the bottom, I, I'm very, you know, I'm familiar with the colored one, but I, the colorful one mm -hmm. as, as being a spectrum when people talk about spectrum. But I, yep. this is the first time I've seen this one where it only has lines of color. And there's ah. a lot of white. I don't. I don't know what that is. Um, if you're looking at a star and there's light coming off of the star, uh, if you want to tell the chemicals that are in the star, that would be your dark lines. But if you look at the bright lines, that's the uh, photons that are coming off of the star. So you can see what kind of uh, emissions the the star is making. Uh, the absorption spectra and the dark lines you're used to because uh, a typical uh, spectroscope will have its own bright white light source and it'll shine light either off of something or get it to absorb the white light and subtract out whatever energy levels it wants. So, you know, the, the popular one is the one that's there on the left. But when you start doing um, research using a spectroscope for other things like what kind of energy is not being absorbed, but what kind of energy is coming off of it, then you only have the bright lines. So, so all the white that's in between, that isn't, that isn't representing anything then, right? Correct. So you only have when it's emitting is this fine line of color. You don't have the variety. Correct. You just, you just have what light is being emitted. And if there's only specific wavelengths only specific wavelengths of uh, photons uh, coming off of whatever you're looking at, then um, you only get those lines. You don't get, you know, a bright light source. Uh, here's here's a good example. If I were to look at the sun in space, I would see one of the lines is kind of greenish. Um, if I look at a different kind of star, an orange star, instead of seeing a green line, I'll see an orange line. If I'm looking at a, um, a red dwarf, I will see lines in the red area. But if I'm looking at a white dwarf, I might see a bunch of lines because a white dwarf is a wider spectra and you see more lines coming out of it. But all I'm seeing is whatever is being emitted. So that's just the, the particular frequencies that I'm looking at. Um, all the rest of the frequencies are not represented. So when I go and put that on a white background, the white doesn't mean anything. It's the color lines that you're interested in. And when you say emitted, it is that, like sometimes we'll be looking at the stars and somebody yeah. will say, oh, that's representing nitrogen and that's a re representing oxygen. Is that what these lines are representing? Or are they representing... Uh, no, these will represent the these will represent the metals in the plasma of the star. Um, if you're looking for the elements that are in the star, those are the ones that are going to be absorbing light. So absorption guy on the left says these are the wavelengths that the uh, thing that you're looking at is absorbing. It wants those. So that tells you what's basically on the inside and is energy hungry. But what it's spitting out, the, the colors that it's spitting out, that's the emission. Thank you very much. Okay. So I just say spectroscope, but there's all kinds of spectroscopes. So when somebody says, uh, we're getting this data from a spectroscope, what kind of spectroscope? What are its uh, characteristics? 
How do I know that it's uh, looking for what I think you want to look for? So you can use a prism or a grating and your spectra, uh, your spectroscope can have a slit on the front of it to narrow down the field of view to just a pinpoint of, of light for stars. Um, the, thing, the thing behind your spectroscope that's picking up the information, it can be uh, monochrome, where it's just picking up uh, brightness in a range like infrared or ultraviolet, or it can be a color camera. Uh, so you can actually take uh, the light from an object and then break it up with a prism and then take the light coming out the back of the prism and shine it onto a color camera. And then you can take the color information in the image produced by the color camera and convert that back into a spectral line. So you can, you can flip the data. Uh, this is where uh, things are going through these days because the most sensitive instruments and the ones that pick up the broadest range of colors are typically cameras. The ones that can pick up the broadest range of excitation energies, amplitudes, those will be things like uh, pin diodes. Uh, but all they're looking for is how much brightness something is, not what its spectral range is. And then there's the field of view. Am I looking at a very wide angle? In other words, am I picking up a field of stars or am I picking up just one star? That's the field of view. And then the sensitivity is, um, do I um, have enough energy coming off the target to excite the electronics of my detector? And then the clip level is, am I getting so much energy from whatever I'm looking at that it's actually sort of hitting the ceiling and I'm actually losing data off the top that gets clipped? And then what is the spectral range of my spectrometer, um, of my spectroscope? You can actually do spectroscopy in radio. And if you remember back to the detections of certain gases in the upper atmosphere of Venus, everybody was very hyped about maybe it being a sign of life. How did you detect this? In radio? Huh. Well, no. That's an energy level coming off of uh, the atmosphere of Venus, and therefore you can do spectroscopy in radio. It doesn't have to be in visual colors. It can be in whatever frequencies you want to consider. So you can have infrared, and the James Webb Space Telescope will have spectroscopes that work in near or mid-infrared levels. It can be visible light. The Hubble Space Telescope has visible light spectroscopy. Um, it can be in ultraviolet or X-ray or even gamma ray, but that's all different kinds of instruments. So the spectral bandwidth is um, when I go to do a sample, what is the width of all the wavelengths that I can take in and divide up? If it's too narrow and there's stuff out at the end, uh, I didn't see them. So if I didn't see them, do they exist? Well, the verdict is still out. And then if you're using a camera, uh, to pick up the actual energy, um, what's its pixel density? So if I spread out that spectra over a certain number of pixels and I have a very fine differentiation in my colors, can I get the color I'm interested in to a pixel or does it fall between two pixels? So the pixel density defines how fine grain um, I can pick up the information. And if it falls outside the limits of my instrument, it's undetectable, but it might still exist. You just don't know. And uh, some people have taken the term spectroscope a little too liberally in that anything that can gather uh, a wide range of data and organize it and split that range into essentially buckets, um, they're referring to those as spectroscopes. So I've seen, um, electron volt energy levels spread across a range sorted by uh, amplitudes and uh, it's just a way of organizing information but they referred to it as a spectroscopic image not quite because there's no wavelength involved it's just a, a way of organizing the data uh, i saw another thing that claimed to be a spectroscope that was organizing the particle size of dust grains so if you were picking up the atmosphere of 
a, a planet, for example, because uh, you've got a rover or a lander on that planet, and you were sampling all the dust grains, and you wanted to say how many of each size of dust grains are there. Um, you know, you size up all the dust grains, then you take your data and put it into columns, and the height of the columns is how many dust grains you saw of that size. And then we're referring to that as a spectroscope. I don't know what to call it. I, I just think it's a way of organizing the data. But uh, those are things that claim to be spectroscopes that have nothing to do with elemental chemistry and the uh, um, energy signatures of things. Okay. I have I have a question and I know it's sure. sort of it's not scientific, but I see these all that every so often and they had them very popular when they had moon rings out and everything changed colors because of heat. And they'd yeah. say this is the spectrum on that and it'd be color coded and you would be able to tell by heat. Uh, yeah. I gather that that was how it was judging. How does that play? In? It doesn't play into this at all or does it? Uh, vaguely. Um, those are thermal crystals, and what they're actually doing is as they get heated up, um, they're changing how they bend light, which means you're not seeing a rainbow, you're seeing a single color or a very narrow band of color. So as they're cold, they might see you know, purple, uh, and as they get hotter, they might see red, uh, and people say, that's your mood. Well, it, it, it's your body temperature, but it doesn't say the chemistry your body's made of. Yes. So they're, they're changing color based upon the energy being applied to it, but it, it's really just bending of light. It's not really spectroscopy in action. And it's not, it's, it's based on heat and chemicals where this is based on. Well, this is, this is based upon chemistry and the mood ring is just based upon energy heat being applied to the rings material okay but they've taken that to the extreme too have you seen the beer cans that when you put the beer in the refrigerator um the paint on the outside of the beer can is a certain color and you don't have to keep checking on the beer to see when it's just cold enough you just look at the can and go oh the mountains have started to show up that means the you know the, the beer can is now cold enough and it's the same sort of thing. It, they, they've taken the, the physics of a mood ring and applied it to the paint on the outside of the can to let you know when um, the can has gotten to 28 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. Interesting. No, I haven't seen that. <laughs> no, that's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it is. <laughs> I do it with tumblers too. Well, I mean, they, they can do that in the opposite direction too. Um, there are um, coffee and tea mugs out there that when you don't have anything in them or you have something cold in them, you don't see an image on the outside of the mug. But as soon as you put something hot in the mug, you can see a hidden thing show up on the outside of the mug. Yeah. <laughs> Some people use that for showing off Doctor Who's TARDIS. Other people use it for showing off, let's just say not general audience acceptable thing. <laughs> <laughs> and as I mentioned earlier, um, it's emissions and absorptions. If I take a light source and I shine it at something and it subtracts out the choice energies that it wants, those are absorption lines. And I can use the specific color of the lines that were absorbed to tell me about the chemistry of the thing that I'm shining my broad spectrum white light on. Or if I'm not providing any light, but I'm looking at the light coming off of something, I can use the bright lines to tell me the chemistry uh, of the object because there's energy being applied to this object and it's spitting out photons. So I can tell what energy is going in. And then as usual, how do you know all this stuff? Well, nobody's born knowing all this stuff and it's not in human genetics. Um, when I was preparing this presentation, I had to go back to my high school and college physics classes and chemistry classes to resurrect things that have been dusty in my brain for 40 plus years. Um, but the, the technology of such instruments um, has improved with time. Uh, you know, 
back when I first looked at uh, spectroscopes, they didn't have these diffraction grading inexpensive things they have now. And they weren't using uh, color cameras to pick up the image. They were using uh, pin diodes and they could only tell brightness at a color. So, you know, I I'm a polymath. So if, if stuff doesn't get out of my way or I don't get barred from learning it, uh, okay. I'll do the research and figure it out. Uh, but if you want to learn, there, there are sources out there. There's NASA. Um, there's the National Science Foundation. There's the Department of Energy Labs. Both DOE and NSF have lots of labs spread around the U.S. Um, and, um, you know, there's a lot more information beyond just Wikipedia and Facebook. And don't, don't just narrow your vision to the U.S. only. Uh, the European Union spends a lot of money on scientific research. Uh, as does the UK, now that they're not part of the EU. Um, Canada spends some amount on it. Um, Central and South America do spend money on it. Um, Australia, New Zealand, yes, they do too. And throughout Asia, including China. Uh, if you think about what is the largest radio telescope at the moment, well, that would be the 500 meter fast radio telescope in China. So... You know, they, they'll create things that are leading edge technology that uh, um, you know, don't think of them as a backward uh, agricultural nation. They, they have a lot of science too. Mm -hmm. uh, but first you need the motivation to look, to be curious. And when you read something like, oh, we would have seen that by now if it was out there, uh, referring to, um, we would have found that other planet in our solar system uh, because we did um, infrared surveys of all the stars in our galaxy. And if there is a uh, warm Jupiter-like object way out at the edge of our solar system, we would have seen it. Sure. And remember me mentioning the characteristics of a spectroscope? Well, cameras have the same characteristics. So if you're looking out over a broad area for very bright light sources, and the thing you want to look at is a very much smaller thing that doesn't produce very much light, like a very sooty covered planet out beyond Pluto, you're not going to see it. It's not that it isn't there. The instruments that you were using just didn't detect it. And I saw that this week there was hints that maybe that larger than Neptune thing out beyond Pluto does exist. And it was our instruments that just failed in detecting it. Ooh. So now the, the um, uh, smaller planet hunters are starting to look differently on the edge of our solar system to see if they can find relatively large things. And I know why they want to look for something large. The current definition of a planet says it has to be large enough for a hydrostatic equilibrium, this gravity, to crush it into a nice spherical shape. And that's one of the characteristics of a planet. Okay, if that thing happens to be far bigger than Earth, and it's out in the Kuiper belt, is it still a dwarf planet? Because that's what Pluto <laughs> is. So maybe as we find uh, new information based upon different observations with different instruments, we might want to relook at that definition of what a planet is. So be open to learning new things and new ways. If you were taught a certain way, eh, things may change as new observations come into view. So for example, uh, 20 years before I was born, we didn't have all these galaxies. We had nebulas. It was the great Andromeda Nebula. It wasn't a galaxy, it was a nebula. And then we finally got uh, instruments that could you know, suss out the fact that, oh, it's bunches of stars. Maybe it's a galaxy like we claim Milky Way is. So things can change in a lifetime. Yes, I can. And whenever you see something, do look for secondary observations and do expect peer review before you get anywhere close to it being factual science. And just because it claims to be factual science doesn't mean that as we go down the road and create better instruments that... Uh, Oh, that was what we knew then, and here's what we know now, so we got to change the game plan. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, can they use uh, the stuff in uh, uh, analyzing criminal scenes and Oh, absolutely. Uh, medical, absolutely. Medical, uh, absolutely. When you, when you go in for your drug test, uh, there's two ways they can do it. One way is they have reactive chemicals that change a certain color based upon the kind of chemicals that are in your, your blood or urine sample. And um, there's another way they can do it with a yeah. mass spectrometer. So they, you know, basically vaporize the material and they look for what colors of light come off of it and it creates a spectra. So they can determine precisely all the chemicals that were in your blood, not just the one that they were looking for to see if you passed your drug test. Uh, so, you know, they, they've been using spectroscopy in um, healthcare and criminal investigations for decades. Uh, I thought so. Yeah. Sounds like something. So well, they could actually take somebody that came in the hospital that might have been poisoned. To try oh yeah, to figure... poisons are a good example because you don't know what they were poisoned by. Yeah. So you 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 can't run just one uh, reactive chemical and say must have been lead because if it turns <laughs> up negative, it could have been arsenic, and the lead the lead testing won't find arsenic. Right. So you've got to vaporize a piece of the sample. And, uh, and vaporizing it, see what the spectra is coming off of it. And that way you know all the chemistry. And when you find chemistry that doesn't match normal baseline blood, that must be the toxin that's in the blood. You know, so it could be uh, something very weird that happens to be a chemical compound, not a specific element. Huh. One time I was on jury duty and they had picked up some guy that was driving erratically and, and the police would chase him about a mile down the road. And when they pulled him over, he was impaired and they had uh, about five dozen pill bottles. None of them had his name on them in the front seat. And uh, the, uh, when it came to the uh, examiner, he got up there and he said he did five different types of blood tests on his blood mm -hmm. and, found all these different chemicals and he and the lawyer was, you know, his jaw fell open, one of these uh, TV lawyers and <laughs> said, why, why'd you do all those tests? He says, I just couldn't believe how many chemicals he had in his bloodstream. And with that, they uh, sent us back to the jury room and I guess they had a plea deal because <laughs> they dismissed us when we came back. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> In that particular case, it sounds more like uh, he took blood samples and he ran, uh, you know, half a dozen different reactive agents because he knew the kinds of chemicals he could easily find, the kinds of pharmaceuticals he could easily find because you're looking for specific things like opiates. Um, yeah. You know, you're looking for specific pharmaceuticals. So you may already have in your test rack the reactive agents for those specific drugs. So if you're looking for marijuana or you're looking for uh, specific brands of formulations of barbiturates, you may, you know, run five different samples against five reactive agents and they all come back positive and you go, yeah. I have no idea what all the chemicals are in this poor guy's blood, but uh, he tested positive for at least, you know, five out of the six things I tested him for. Yeah, they... They, they ran the video of him trying to, you know, walk a straight line. It was like America's <laughs> funniest home videos. <laughs> well, the, the, the funny thing with that is, um, and, you know, if, if you're aware of it, you can be a diabetic and you, you can have a blood uh, chemical level that actually produces a blood alcohol response. Uh -huh. uh, so... Um, you could have been a little woozy, driving erratically, pulled over, and when they do the breathalyzer test on you, you come back as, uh, what, what have you been drinking? I haven't been drinking anything. Well, that's the alcohol that your body is producing because of the sugar level that you have. Oh, yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah. By the way, by the way, if you want to get out of jury duty, uh, say you haven't been vaccinated. Oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I, I don't get out of jury duty. I usually go for the jury duty because I just want the fun of it. I'm retired yeah. nowadays, so I, yeah, I'll just go because almost a hundred percent of the time, as soon as they go through blood year and they start asking questions and they come yeah. to me, what's your background? Are you a very technical person? I am not only very technical, I'm very precise. Yeah. Oh, um, you can step down now. And it doesn't matter whether it's on, you know, on, on the prosecution or the defense. It's like, we don't want a guy like that on our jury. Right. Okay. And if you get that far along, the judge will just say, I thank you for your time. Uh, you're dismissed. And that doesn't mean you go back to the jury pool. That means I don't know of any jury that wants your ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, because there will be a judge that will get his, you know, is to get out of jail free. Uh, I don't want you on my juries. You know, I, I just don't like the cut of your jib, as the saying goes. Um, yeah. And you'll get dismissed. And the judge is aware of that. So as soon as you come across being too analytical for a prosecutor that's looking for a technical, uh, a loose technical convict, or a defense that's looking for a tight technical acquittal, um, neither side will want you on the jury. All right. So that's what I've always found is um, yeah. just tell them what you are and what you're capable of and, you know, how are you going to analyze things? And yeah. everyone is innocent until proven guilty in a court of law by the evidence that's put forth to me. That's true. Okay. <laughs> not going to be swayed by emotion. No, probably not. Uh -uh. <laughs> nope. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I do have empathy do have for the empathy. grieving family members and that kind of stuff, but that's not a means of convicting someone. No, it's not. It's not. Uh, nope. <laughs> and, and a lot of times you're just playing pretty stupid. So <laughs> They're looking for people that uh, are more swayed by emotion and don't have a clue of, as to the technology and, you know, what's, what's true and what's not true. And, um, what's detectable and what's not detectable. And, you know. uh, and that's very unfortunate, really. Yeah. Well, you're supposed to be judged by a jury of your peers, not a jury of the most technically astute people you can find. Uh -huh. mm. But uh, I know that in a lot of healthcare cases, they will find the most technically astute position they can for the circumstances of the case and pay them a lot of money to basically say either the physician did wrong or the physician did nothing outside of procedure, depending upon whether you want, you know, who's, who's the doctor um, testifying for. Yep. So in conclusion, spectroscopes are scientific instruments. They can be used in many forms of research, including uh, astronomy, space, chemical industry, healthcare, and in crime labs, criminal investigation, they tell us what things are made up of, what their chemistry is. Um, we can analyze emissions and the light can be reflected, transmitted. Um, um, you can have an energized gas or the materials being ionized to plasma and you can have absorption. So a lot of different ways to capture the light that you're looking for. Um, uh, the uh, location of what you're analyzing can tell you the information about it. So if, for example, um, you're analyzing uh, a blood sample uh, and the blood sample is, um, let's say, indirectly obtained through the sweat produced by your body, it can determine by the spectral analysis of your sweat, um, you know, how much glucose we have roaming around in your body if you're diabetic. So this is how we move from pricking your finger with a reagent that then tells you from a color band, you know, what your blood chemistry is to a digital device that you wear on your arm that tells you what your blood chemistry is. And it's all about taking the chemistry and sussing out the energy levels, either introduced and coming back or being absorbed. But spectroscopes can be very big and very expensive in the case of things like spacecraft, or they can be tiny 
wearable electronic devices. So some of you, some of you might be wearing a fitness tracker and it can track your blood oxygen level or your blood hemoglobin, your iron level in your blood. These little tiny things are actually spectroscopes because they uh, take a spectra of light, they shine it through your skin and they look at what colors come back up through your skin based upon that light. Uh, they don't shine a white light because then the skin and the blood will absorb that and come back as a different color. They'll actually shine either uh, infrared or green or ultraviolet light. Not too often ultraviolet because that's you know, not good for your skin to be getting ultraviolet radiation. So it'll typically be green or uh, infrared. And based upon the kind of light that comes back from that illumination, they can tell about the chemistry of your bloodstream. So when you go to hospitals and uh, somebody sticks that thing on the end of your finger and tells all sorts of stuff about your blood chemistry, iron and copper and carbon monoxide and oxygen levels, of, um, there's actually a patent on that by a company called Massimo. I think they're owned by Philips nowadays. Um, it's called rainbow technology. And the rainbow is they have a little tiny camera in the instrument and they shine a very bright white light into your tissue and based upon the colors that come back and the colors that don't come back, they can tell the chemistry of the vessels underneath your finger. So that's what they do in hospitals. But they've advanced that technology and now you can get an SpO2 meter that you can buy at your local Walgreens and it will measure your blood oxygen level. And I think the latest ones will actually even measure your hemoglobin level, but they won't get into some of the more um, precisely measured things like copper and carbon, carbon monoxide. So they'll just stick to the easy to claim to the FDA they can do it kind of stuff um, oh. because this, this is a medical instrument. But if you go outside of that and you say, what can I buy on Amazon coming in from China? Um, I actually have for under $40, a wristwatch looking thing. It's kind of like an Apple watch that I can wear that it measures my heart rate, my blood oxygen, um, my blood pressure. Now that, that one's an interesting, like, how do you measure blood pressure? The camera samples so fast, it actually takes a picture of your vessel inside your skin and it sees it go, boom, boom. And it measures how wide the vessel gets versus how narrow the vessel gets. And so it has a range of blood pressure. Amazing what they can do with this. That, tiny is, that is amazing. Curve. I have been wondering that for so long how they yeah. could do that. Yeah, they're actually taking a microscopic photograph of your blood vessel inside your tissue on your wrist. I mean, when you want to take somebody's pulse, what do you do? You hold your fingers like this, make sure you don't do your, use your thumb. You hold your fingers on their wrist and you feel the pulsations of their pulse. Well, that can tell you pulse rate. And they do this with a little camera. But if they're doing it with a little camera, if the camera is sampling fast enough, it can actually see when your blood vessel grows and shrinks, grows and shrinks. Wow, that's wonderful. And if you I do that, my blood pressure take hey, that. you have systolic and diastolic. That is great. Yeah. I wish they had that instead of squishing my arm all the time. That's for sure. That hurts. Okay. <laughs> I got to do away okay. with that blood pressure machine. Ugh. Think think of it this way. If they're already doing it on wristwatches coming out of China that are not monitored by FDA, um, what do you think the big name medical device companies already have at their disposal? They have the same technology. It's just a matter of them doing the software quality assurance, um, you know, the, the risk management, and then filing all the 510K paperwork with the FDA. So look for blood pressure cuffs to maybe, you know, go the way of the dinosaur. Uh, but I know, I, know that, I know that when you go into a doctor's office, if the clinician wants to take your blood pressure, Squeeze bulb, stethoscope, cuff. Yeah, it's sort of a healthcare 
you Old know, school. like people expect, will expect you to have a blood pressure cuff in your healthcare. And so yeah. it will be a, a training for people to accept it. But yeah. also there's a, it's a big business, the blood pressure cuff. I mean, everybody oh, yeah. has a blood pressure cuff and they recommend everybody to have one at home. So, I mean, this would be putting a lot of people out of business, I gather. No, it would be putting a lot of people in business to make all these new devices and service them. Yeah. But what it will do is say, uh, 10 years from now, if you walk into your physician's office and you see he's got a, a Zoll uh, bracketed analog mercury blood pressure uh, indicator on his wall and a cuff and a squeeze bulb and a stethoscope, you go, hey, doc, when are you going to catch up with the times? Yeah. <laughs> And his response will be, I paid for this 30 years ago. It's saving me money every time I use it. Yeah. Yeah. And see, that's, that's what I That's, that's what just, I, that's how uh, physicians' offices are run. If something works and the newfangled stuff is not cheap enough and they're not backed into a corner, kicking and screaming to spend the money on it, you know, the measurement itself doesn't change with technology you're still measuring the two values and the heart rate. So as long as you can still get those numbers off the old analog equipment, there you go. So they'll continue to use them until they're dragged kicking and screaming into modern technology. Well, they have these handheld thermometers now. You know, of course. Uh, but, uh, when will they get the medical tricorders? Uh, they already have them. Yeah. <laughs> Um, if you oh, look into the research labs of GE and Philips and Siemens and places like that, uh, they have better than that. You remember in the original Star Trek, the bio beds, where yes, the patient would just uh, lay on the bed and the display would yeah. start showing you all the indicators? Yeah. They have bio beds. Of course. You know what they yeah. do? They what? measure infrared heat coming off of your body and they actually send... Uh, low levels of microwave radiation into your body and they can actually detect the uh, expansion and compression of your heart and your vessels and you just lay on the bed and you they, they don't make it as a whole new bed it's just a pad that you can insert under the mattress oh and wow. then you connect it up to the computer and all of a sudden you can have on the computer monitor all the stuff about the patient, their respiration, their heart rate, their systolic and diastolic. Um, so a lot of those things are already there. And as long as it's a cheap enough retrofit to an existing bed, yeah, great. But remember, hospitals who want to do this in as many places as possible for as little money per point of care as possible. Yeah. So... Uh, several years ago, Philips yeah. came out with um, a very uh, advanced piece of technology called a vital signs monitor. And whenever you're doing those patient admission, patient discharge measurements, or you're doing the periodic just general assessment of the patient, and you're measuring their heart rate and blood pressure and temperature, there are now electronic devices that you can use that will do that. So you have something electronically measuring the temperature electronically measuring the blood pressure and the heart rate. And as soon as it measures it, you push a button, it sends it to your patient records on the network. Yeah. So there's no more physical transcription. Now, why would they put in all this advanced technology? Because the price point of the vital signs monitor dipped below the issue of, I want to put one of these with every patient. Oh, they don't. They have one that rolls around on a pole. Yeah. So they have the clinician or, you know, not a full RN, somebody with uh, less credentials. They're the ones taking all the measurements and they're rolling this around down the hallway, patient by patient. They, you know, have a barcode scanner that reads the patient's ID off the wristband, loads up the patient identification into the device, and then they hook up the patient to the device, do a couple of scans push the button to store the data and disconnect the patient and go on to the next room. Right. So as soon as they have all of these advanced technologies, those things are just going to change the sensors on the device without changing the device. 
and it means they can do it faster. Yes. If you can take samples faster with devices that don't have disposable things on them, that's lower cost for operations of the hospital and they're gonna do it. Yeah. So the one thing in hospitals that is more prolific than vital signs monitors that are shared and you roll down the hall. Cat scans. <laughs> nurse right. call. Nurse calls the cheapest data connected thing in hospitals because you have nurse call pull cords or indicators at every patient bed, at nurses stations, in hallways, in every bathroom, in the shower of every bathroom. Um, True. You just have to have them. So the point of care instance for nurse call has to be incredibly cheap. But they want more data. And I've, I've worked with nurse call vendors who, instead of it just being like, well, we can have a panel and you got a pull cord that anonymously says, I want something. They now have panels that have buttons on them. You can say, I want water, ice chips, a blanket. Uh, yeah. Just come a running. Uh, I'm not going to be specific. Uh, you know, patient in, in distress. Um, they've made smarter nurse call panels. And they said, it would cost a lot of money to wire up all those panels. Why don't we make them uh, wireless? So there, there are nurse call vendors out there selling wireless nurse call panels, which means you can deploy them fast. Well, and, they're only as effective as the person who answers. Like yes. Robin was in the hospital trying to get a hold of the nurse, and, yes. and she couldn't. She called me. She wasn't making any sense. And I figured, oh, she's having a stroke. Mm -hmm. So I called the nurse's station directly on by another phone mm -hmm. and, and said, you know, that the patient and such and such is having a stroke right now. And, and they said, they put me on hold, of course, but I could hear on the other phone that they literally ran into that room. Yeah. A lot of them ran into that room and, yes. and they helped her. It was just a, like a TIA or something, but uh, <laughs> they were, yeah. I had to go through telephone. <laughs> yes. um, I, I worked with the hospital to um, make nurse call more effective by triaging the generic nurse call cord pull um, yeah. using the pillow speaker, that remote control that she used to control the TV. Yeah. Uh, it's actually got a speakerphone in it. Yeah. And your clinician can be down the hall, get a cord pull, and then the clinician can respond back and say, uh, this is nurse Jackie, uh, what do you need? And then right. the patient can say, I need a blanket. So when the clinician arrives in the patient's room, they arrive with the blanket. You don't need the second step of, okay, what do you need? A blanket. Well, let me go get one. And I'll be back. You can take that step out. And they found that if you assign a small dedicated staff to just triaging nurse call, it frees up clinician's time. So yeah. you can have a person that's not a clinician respond by the pillow speaker to say, um, this is nurse call. How can I help you? And the patient can say, I need a blanket. And so then the triage person can say, why send an RN to do that? Where's the nearest volunteer? I can have them go get you a blanket. And then the person arrives in the room. Here's your blanket. You know? So I, I've worked with many optimizations to try and uh, best use the technology that's there rather than spending the money to advance the technology. Because yeah. they, they really, if you look at the scale, if you said, um, I'm going to look at a 400 bed hospital and every infusion pump at this hospital now needs to be replaced. Oh boy. It's many millions of dollars because there's thousands of infusion pumps. In fact, hospitals use so many infusion pumps that they don't actually buy them, they lease them. Oh, wow. You know, because if all of a sudden there's a COVID surge, they very suddenly need 50 extra infusion pumps. And if they were to go to the manufacturer and say, I need 50 extra infusion pumps, right now the manufacturer would say, we don't have those in inventory. We'll have to build another batch of them. 
uh-huh. but you can go buy from a leasing company a lease for a variable number of them and they'll say we've got 2000 in stock we'll have 50 there for you tomorrow yeah but the thing they didn't count on is ventilators all right now because of covid you need all of a sudden 10 ventilators oh those aren't in the leasing company's inventory that's why there was this crush for a while to how fast can we make an fda qualified ventilator and they started having you know fly by night companies that don't quite understand the um the process of creating safe medical devices and they were cooking up ventilators and like the, the, I, I just sort of cringed at that and went i hope somebody's watching out for the patient um and uh yeah. I didn't hear I didn't hear any catastrophic or you know any sentinel events from it, but um, I was concerned for the patients by these. Sure, I can make a ventilator for you. Uh, how do you spell ventilator? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> by Ronco. <laughs> no, by never heard of them before, and once they make their millions, never hear them again. That's yeah. right. <laughs> so yeah. But just just look for this uh, technology to be out there because if you can do it cheaper, smaller, faster, have it automatically record the digital data without somebody accidentally incorrectly transcribing it and causing problems for a patient, um, that's just going to slowly wedge its way into the technology used uh, throughout healthcare, uh, from hospitals to doctors' offices to in-home healthcare to just personal care devices um you know you know that thing where you put your fingers on it and it yes i was just about to mention that yes i watched i watched that device come into being and i said it's not fda 510k yet but if it turns out to be something very popular yeah they're going to get it and the price instead of being i think it came out at like 300 dollars is going to be sub hundred dollars yeah. Because the actual technology for that is very cheap, yep. maybe twenty bucks, uh, right. and that includes the packaging they put it in. I think uh, it was like sixty. And, yeah, and they started out with it only working on iPhones. Yeah, and then they did they did the extra software to make it work on uh, um, Android as well, uh, and now they've got commercials on TV of, look, you just do this, and yep. Well, uh, I'm I'm sorry. That's that's not really a heart monitor. Uh, no. A heart monitor either has eight leads or twelve leads. This is a one lead heart monitor. If you've yeah. been in healthcare for a while, it's like, how good is a one lead heart monitor? Uh, which lead are you getting? Um, whatever comes through your fingers. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> it says you have a pulse, and it says what your heart rate is. And it says whether your heart is spiky or not. So uh-huh. they can detect uh, the two major ones, uh, atrial and what's the other one? Bradycardia. Atrial. Oh, bradycardia. Yeah. yeah. So they, they can detect if your heart rate is fast or slow and whether it's thready. Uh-huh. But that's all they can detect. They can't detect, oh, this muscle on your heart is, is not really putting out enough signal and you're having a heart attack. Right. So, um, but the general public just goes, cool, I've got a professional grade heart monitor. Look at this. No, you don't. No, you don't. No, it's a toy. <laughs> well, no, it's, it's, it's more than a toy, but it's less than a professional grade instrument. Yeah. It, it does give you indications, but it's more like, you know, it's, it's one step before you feeling woozy or you feeling hyper. That's that's yeah. really what it can detect is if your pulse is is just about to become noticeably thready and you're doing that, it can detect it. But once you take your fingers off of it, it can't detect squat. Right. So unless you have it strapped to your wrist and you're wearing it all the time, it's not really that great a monitor. Right. Which well, is why uh, I think what, the, they, what they say is the advantage is that it can compare uh, your previous reading to a current reading to see if there's any changes. Yes. 
when you right. when when you call your physician's office and they want a spot check reading on you, yeah, and you use this thing, he can get a one line read on you right there in real time and decide. Yeah. Yeah, if you're feeling a little funny, I can see that your heart is uh, thready. You know, your pulse is thready. So let's get you in right now. I'm going to go ahead and call 911 for you an ambulance. Yeah. So it's they're not useless, but the you know the, the, the total value of them is within limits. Right. But I think once once you can have something that you wear all the time. And is maybe powered by the electrical uh, energy in your body, which there's, there's, they're, they're working on body electric already. Uh, because if you make the technology, the electronic circuitry small enough to emit such a small amount of light and detect it, you know, not all the time, but periodically, then you can start to do uh, a charge up of a special kind of capacitor called a supercapacitor. So, Someday, hopefully, you'll be wearing a ring that will be your health monitor. If and you remember, about five years ago, they had a fashion show where they had people that um, were being able to tell what their temperature, blood pressure, basic vital signs were by the color, the lighting in their clothes. They, they did yeah, something yeah, I that. I, I forget what it was. Called. That was pretty cool, but then, then it didn't become popular. Yeah. So, but what they what they want what what the uh, broad adoption is going to be is if in a ring that is self charging by your body electricity every half an hour it can take uh, a, a group of samples maybe eight different kinds of samples of data and then send those to an app on your phone which will then send it up to the cloud for your personal healthcare record that you can then share with your um, physician mm -hmm. for whatever ailment you happen to have, that's going to save a lot of lives. Yeah. Because if you have continuous monitoring and it is the right set of things and you don't have to, you know, you know, overtly go take a sample. It's just, it's always there sampling. Um, that's going to save lives. Well, sleep number bed, ha it has a, a connection to the iPhone. It that analyzes how you sleep and all. So you just put the biometric bed on that and and and, and yes, but I don't think sleep number wants to go through the millions of dollars it will cost to have an FDA 510 510k registered bed mattress. Yeah. <laughs> one one of the things that I found was interesting was uh, Apple was supposedly uh, got patents so that just simply by wearing a watch uh, your skin will charge the watch up. Yeah. And I think that's cool. So yeah, well, have like, like I said, when they get to a ring, then we've got it. Um, I'd like to have some uh, hearing aids that got charged by your skin so you didn't have to worry about <laughs> that going. Well, yeah. see, the, the problem with it is um, hearing aids are continuous. Chi. Yes. <laughs> so you always want to hear. You don't want to hear every 30 minutes. <laughs> With sampling of something on your wrist or on your finger, it can spend, you know, 29.9 minutes charging up and then for a fraction of a second, take all the samples, send the data up, and then you're depleted of energy. Wait another 30 minutes to do the sample. But your hearing aids are like, uh, that takes a lot of juice. And uh, yeah. they, yes. Actually, yes. they actually have a battery that you can wear inside your body uh, for uh, incontinence, oh. for example. And you put a belt on once a month to charge it. Well, that's, that's how um, cardiovascular devices work. The implanted uh, um, heart monitoring and heart stimulation, those work off of a very high quality uh, battery inside of them and periodically they just put a probe on your chest and make measurements of the device and if they see that um, you know it, it's in need of a charge they just strap a thing on you and inductively charge you like as if you're a cell phone yeah mechanics uh, mechatronics did that kind of stuff 
Oh yeah. With, yeah, like pacemakers and stuff. I think they, they quit doing that though. They're not doing it anymore. That's because everybody got involved and there's no proprietary thick money for it. <laughs> ah. Yeah, that, that's why companies get out of this stuff. Whenever you see a large company getting involved in something that takes a lot of research and they come out with a very expensive but unique device with lots of patents, um, <laughs> when, they, when they get towards the end of the thick money, the thick revenue slice for that, and everybody has them, they will leave that uh, marketplace because there's just yeah. not enough money to keep their interest. Yeah. So as soon as everybody has the ring or the watch, you're going to see the big names go, I'll pass. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the hackers will come out too, so. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, they're building these devices on top of uh, fairly stable software stacks that are, are very protected already. So they do authentication and encryption of devices and they do um, uh, bonding of the Bluetooth device to your Bluetooth receiver. And you know, they're not just hackers doing this stuff. And um, there's an annual hackathon where uh, we, you do have uh, white hats. These, white these, hats. Are these are people that want to prove that your stuff isn't secure and they will stage an event where bring your best and let's see what we can do. And sometime during it, your device will become hacked and they'll go, what if we were a black hat? We're a yeah. white hat. We're here to help you. Here's what your problem is. So at yeah. the end of it, if your device comes away and sorry, couldn't be hacked, that's good stuff, but that goes into the next software baseline for all the products to take advantage of it. Yeah. Well, there was this guy that uh, claimed he could hack the Metronics device, like pacemakers and stuff. And um, uh, the night before that convention, he was murdered. Oh, no. I wonder who did it. <laughs> yeah. oh, well, rem remember that these devices don't have a very long range because a long range would require a lot of energy and they can't expend a lot of energy on wireless communication. Yeah. So it has to be somebody close. And uh, <clears throat> you have to know the device's I internal identifier before the device will communicate with you. Uh, I, I work in um, medical device data interoperability and we see these identifiers. So um, if you want to go adversely affect someone's pacemaker, you first have to get data from it. Now, how did you get the data from it? Well, um, if you're wearing uh, a large enough antenna and receiver and you're standing next to them at uh, a supermarket or a, a Home Depot, or if they're a, a physician, you're standing next to them at a professional trade show, um, their device is not giving off much of anything. But if your snooping device puts out a, uh, an energy field of the right frequency, it will trigger the device to produce data. Uh -huh. But it won't give away its internal key. That's what something it expects to receive. So it may say, here's my serial number. And until you say, I recognize your serial number and here's your internal key, the device won't uh, allow itself to be commanded. So uh, yeah. Yeah, they, they fixed that. Why That's can't they good. do that with phones? Uh, you know, a lot of people have RFI uh, uh, hack, uh, detectors that, that try to get information off of your cell phones. Yeah, well... The, the best way to describe the best way to describe it is there are people that don't know how to protect their phone, and they leave themselves ex themselves exposed. And uh, when something bad happens, they want to blame somebody but themselves. Right. Now, if you if you leave your phone where the Bluetooth is always turned on and transmitting, um, you know you, you could have a problem. If you yeah. leave your Wi-Fi on and um, you don't have encryption for it, you could have a problem. Um, yeah. If you're at, uh, let's say someplace and you want free internet, 
and you don't ha- care who you get it from, uh, you could have a problem. Right. So, you know, you need to pay attention to these things. Yeah. We can't leave our front door unlocked anymore is the best way to describe it. Well, they have like these RFI cases uh, yeah. where you, you have your phone in that and then you can't even use your, you know, right. Apple Pay. <laughs> might, 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 as well have, might as well have your phone on airline mode. Yeah. Because <laughs> all your radio is turned off. Oh, yeah. Think about it for a moment. How many radios are in a modern day cell phone, modern day mobile phone? Oh boy. Eight. Eight. There's eight, eight distinct radios. Really? You've got your Wi Fi, 2.4 gigahertz, your Wi Fi, 5 gigahertz, your Bluetooth, low energy, your near field communication, your uh, GPS, and GPS has multiple bands, and it's just like, I mean, that's just off the top of my head, six different radios. I know there's eight radios in a cell phone. Wow. Now, Monroe, you talked about white hats. What are the qualifications for that? And oh, okay. Would you, um, would you qualify for it? Uh, I'm not skilled enough in encryption hacking. Um, but if I, if I put my effort to it, yeah, I, I could probably become a white hat. But uh, there's not yeah. a lot of money in it. And uh, you, you might get hired up by a company until they figure out what you're telling them. And then they go, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Yeah. And it's a short-term, it's short-term contract. And when you go to one of these hackathons where there's a lot of white hats, uh, you know, the white hats travel and lodging might be paid for, but they're not getting any money out of it. They're just trying to show off that they can hack somebody's, you know, fancy big name product. Well, Apple used to offer rewards if you could hack them. Yes. And, and that this one guy that got killed uh, was one of the few guys or only guys that I knew of that could hack Apple. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, so I, I don't think Apple killed him. I was mm-hmm. more like probably. <laughs> but, well, uh, the, the, they, the United... but they knew who he was and they kept an eye on him. And yeah. every time he hacked something, they fixed it. <laughs> yeah. Um, the U.S. government has an organization. Uh, they have a, a site you can go to, U.S.-CERT. It's the uh, Critical uh, Environment, uh, Critical Infrastructure Resource Technology, or something. Um, CERT uh, what, is uh, uh, Civilian Emergency Response Team. Yeah, uh, and, and what they do is. If you think you've been hacked, you contact the FBI, they contact CERT, and CERT will see if you've been hacked by something that you should have put the patches in and protected yourself from, or you should have set the setting other than default and open. Um, And if it's something new and different, they will find out what the root cause of the hack was. They will work with vendors like Microsoft and uh, Norton to come up with solutions and detections. And then they'll put that in their updated software uh, to both fix the exposure and add it as a detection. So there are US government, thank you, very well-funded organizations that are out there trying to protect us from ourselves. (laughs) But if 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 you think, for example, that Apple is sort of a God's gift to secure computing. You might want to go out on the U.S. CERT website and look up their monthly list of exposures. Uh Um, It goes in spurts. You might find that a particular month, um, Apple has no exposures listed. And then the following month, it might have a half a dozen exposures. And they all have the same root cause. It's just somebody found something that somebody left open. And so all of these avenues were open to it. And depending upon how fast the company turns to and solves the problem, it may only be open for a month. Uh, If a bunch of things come in and they have a lot of work to do in the software, it might be open for six months. So the laundry list of exposures varies and um, Apple is not perfect. Linux is not perfect. 
Microsoft is not perfect. But the reason why I know all these things is because at one time I worked for a medical device company and our company was on that list because we have medical devices in hospitals that run off the shelf software like Windows and Linux. And yeah. when those software systems have exposures, we have to know to package the patch into the next software update of the medical device. Right. So that's how I know about those sorts of things. But I In get emails periodically. Days. Oh, this instrument's got a problem. It has this exposure or this operating system. And you know, I'll see Apple, I'll see Linux, I'll see Microsoft. None of them are immune. Yes. Um, Apple this uh, within the last two weeks sent out a, a notice saying um, your your um, Apple device is leaking. And yeah. um, is leaking data. And so yeah. I, I was like hysterical, of course. And I called <laughs> to Apple to find out what this was about. And they said that what in the past, Apple's belief was is that it was not their issue if Facebook got hacked or if mm -hmm. Bank of America got hacked or some yep. other app that you're using on your, yep. your device. They did not believe they needed to notify you because it's up to Facebook to notify you. It's up to Bank of America to notify you. It's up to anyone to notify you. Well, so, they, but they, they then, changed then the, in the last two weeks, Apple changed their mind and decided that they would notify you if, you're, no, if you Apple, have any kind of leaks. Apple did not change their mind. The US government changed the rules. Oh. If you have an <laughs> off the shelf platform and you're aware of an exploit of one of the applications running on your platform. Now that we have all these stores, these app stores. Yes. If, for example, the Apple App Store allows a particular app to be sold on their app store. Right. Apple now has culpability for uh, that being a quality piece of software. Uh, so if that app, which Apple verified and allowed in, is now leaking data, um, Apple has some skin in the game, so they have no problem going, we're going to tell our customers. It's not yeah. because Apple, out of the wonderfulness of their heart, suddenly said, no, we're going to take the ball and be involved. No, 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 no. The, the oh, government no. said, no, you, you're selling the app. You have culpability. Uh, so, well, the customer service person said mm. that it was because of the goodness in their hearts and found yeah. that they were having problems for their customers and they wanted to yeah. help them out. Yeah. And, and, and when did marketing give them that, that line to I say? I believe that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would love to go visit the, uh, the customer support lines when I see things like that and go, I got this email saying that my phone is leaking data. Could I like... Put a couple of paper towels underneath it and maybe it won't leak. <laughs> Monroe? Yes. So um, how, how come Apple is responsible when they don't make any money off uh, distributing things through their app store? <laughs> they make a whole lot of money off of distributing things through their app store. Um, anytime you see one of those 99 cent items, um, the software vendor that wanted to put the app on the Apple store, they spent a lot of money with Apple. The app that's like $3.99, 75% of that $3.99 goes to Apple. But most Apple of makes I get, a lot of money off their anything. app store. I, I, most of the app I get don't cost anything. Well, if you get an Apple provided app that didn't cost you anything, it's because the app vendor that made the app made it under contract for Apple. Okay. Apple didn't develop that. So okay. Apple has direct culpability then. Hmm. Yeah, Apple, I, I understand. They, they also, uh, if you uh, buy a game and then you have to buy things in the game, they make money every time you buy something in the game oh, yes. as well, right? So yes, that, that's, a, that's a distinction between Apple and uh, Android is uh, there's certain classes of games that have ads on Android that um, Google doesn't make any further money off of it. But every time you see an ad come up in a game or in some app that you've got on your, your Apple device, Apple makes a piece of the pie every time you go in and you buy something through one of those ads. 
Um, so, so there is one thing I did want to ask, though, about Apple uh, that I, I heard a news article either this morning or uh, yesterday on the radio. Uh, it, it said that Apple has started a, a, a service where they're going where anything that's stored on iCloud, um, they're going to scan for known child pornography and report it to the police. Um, that it's not an opt-in option. That your option is not to use iCloud. Um, had you heard of this or no? Yeah, I heard of that, but I'm waiting for the courts to weigh in on it. Um, if they're scanning for child pornography, that's not a bad thing. But how do they know what child pornography is? Well, everyone just looking at it would know that. No, 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 that's not so. It's they have certain things that have already been ruled as child pornography, and they're only oh. looking for those things. But the thing is that they're scanning people's devices, people who didn't commit any crime. They're, they're essentially doing that something that the, the United States government can't just go from door to door and look and see if you did it. And yes. to me, though, the central problem isn't even that. The central problem is what you said before. The devices are so damn insecure, Apple and Android and anything else, that now so all somebody has to do is hack it, put on child pornography, and wait for Apple to turn it into the police. I mean, they wouldn't have had to kill Khashoggi, right? They could have just well, put, <laughs> put child pornography on his thing. He wouldn't be a journalist anymore. It, it, um, it's, I, 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 to me, you, I think that's, you, that's the most serious thing of all about it. No? You haven't, you haven't watched enough crime shows on TV where – the nefarious uh, police force puts dirty content on a person's phone and then calls law enforcement and complains about it because they want the guy to be picked up and dragged over the coals because then they can ask him the questions they really want to ask him, which has nothing to do with kitty porn. Right. So I think, of, I think of it as if you're storing your data on your device, then they shouldn't have the ability to look at it. If you're storing data in their cloud, you signed a healthy end user license agreement that says we can do whatever we want to with whatever data you store, including not be responsible for reliably storing it. So if you lose it, not our problem. Mm -hmm. So if you put it up in the cloud and they start scanning it for whatever content, you know, how many times you like the color blue. Uh, if they're scanning it for A, they can scan it for A to Z. And you'll never know what new letters they add in the middle mm -hmm. until they just do. So Apple has often run aground of how they collect the data and what they use it for. If they're scanning the data for criminal intent, they can also scan the data for, oh, and here's the pictures of the products you like to buy. And here's the online invoices of things you buy. And we can sell that information to advertisers. And how are you going to know? Well, well, that, that's true. But I think the way that they're uh, scanning the data is by looking at a file and looking at a hash code or something and saying if the file is this size and it uh yeah. some algorithm for that looks at this code that it's not uh uh looking at all your photos that though they could and probably mm -hmm. they are they you sign something that they're allowed to that they're mm -hmm. looking to see did this particular file with this particular one this is known that this was a child in 1994 yeah. that it's a very popular uh a thing among child porn aficionados that uh, uh, and therefore they're searching for that particular one. So um, I'm someone experienced in graphic manipulation. Uh, I've often had to take images and um, adjust them so that software couldn't match it. Um, if I, if I want to store a unique image, if I'm taking a picture of the same thing again and again and again and again, um, and I don't want the cache optimization software to say, well, that's the same picture. I'm going to ignore, you know, every time after the first, then I've got to have a way of adjusting every image that I send, even though it's of the same scene, so that it thinks 
every one of those is different and must be cached. All you have to do is take the image, expand it, compress it, and then send it. And the fact that you expand and compress it so scrambles all the pixels that the uh, artifacts change in the compression. So when you, when you zoom way up and you see like little T's and angles and stuff in a compressed image, if you expand it and then you transfer it digitally and then you compress it, you've created new artifacts. And you can no longer say that that's the same as the original image because they don't compare the same. So I can see how this kind of algorithm, um, it works for only undoctored photos is the best way to describe it. Well, I appreciate the tip in case I ever uh, need to go into the business. Uh, I would not advise that particular business. <laughs> <laughs> Not, not the graphic manipulation, the kitty form. I would advise strongly against that. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, that was all I had for tonight. Um, I'm still spending lots of time building my uh, James Webb telescope parts. And uh, I came to the conclusion this week, it might be better if instead of trying to paint things, I just buy different colors of filament for my printer. So for example, when I need the five layers of reflective material and the bottom most layer is actually purple, there you go, that's all you needed to do. So I, what would normally be in, in uh, other models, um, you know, sheets of mylar that somebody cut out precisely and then stretch them over the hole, like, nope, I know the shave it, it's just an algorithm and I just scale them small to large and make sure there's always this nice octagonal hole in the center. And uh, that's my reflectors for my uh, James Webb Space Telescope. And uh, I like the mirror. Okay, let me show you the mirror. That's uh, two thirds of the mirror. I'm working on the hinge for the other side of the mirror. And uh, the mirrors are all gold because I just use gold filament to print them. And look, it even folds just like the web does. Oh, neat. <laughs> and there's another one that we mounted over here that has the other three. And if you think, did you actually print all the individual mirrors? Yes, I did. And if you look closely, yes, indeed, the mirror, she is curved. Mm. Yes. Oh. So. That's artwork. I'm trying to get it as true as possible to the real deal. 